Travel all over the countryside, Oscar Leyland, Oscar Leyland. Travel all over the countryside, Oscar Leyland, brother. Whatever it is that you want to see, Oscar Leyland, Oscar Leyland. No matter whatever that happens to be, Oscar Leyland, brother. Ask the Leyland Brothers is the name of this new series, and that's exactly what we'd like you to do. Ask us whatever it is you'd like to see. Right, Mo? That's right, Mel. In the past ten years of television filmmaking, we've had hundreds of letters from interested viewers with subjects for us to film. In some cases, we've been able to fit these into programs. In others, we haven't been in the right areas, but not anymore. That's right. From now on, just write in. And each week, from selected letters, we'll travel anywhere in Australia or New Zealand to bring the answers to you. Now, the subject matter is pretty broad. It can be history, people, places, anything really, as long as the answer is interesting. It could be something you've seen and would like others to see, or something you've heard about, or even read about. If it's interesting, we'd like to hear from you. So just write to Ask the Leyland Brothers, Post Office Box 900 Newcastle, New South Wales, 2300. That's Ask the Leyland Brothers, Post Office Box 900 Newcastle. Now, to give you an idea of what we have in mind, we've made this introductory episode using letters which we've received over the past few years. We'll show you how to prepare your vehicle for an around Australia trip. And we'll show you a mountain that's been burning for over 2,000 years and some sculpture in the outback. I've just been going through the many letters we've received in the past few years. And there's one question which appears to crop up more than any other. And that is, how do I plan for a trip around Australia? How do I prepare my vehicle and what do I do? Letters such as this one from Ross and Nell Thomas in Canberra. They say they bought a four-wheel drive vehicle and they go on to say, we seem to have a problem finding books on what to expect on a trip such as this and what preparations to make. And this is why we're writing. Well, in answer to Mr and Mrs Thomas's request and everybody else's, we're going to now take a detailed look at what to do to your vehicle before you set out on a trip. But what you do depends on where you're going. So the first step is to look at the map of Australia, decide exactly where you're going to go, and most important, how much time you have. Once you've done that, then we can take a look at the vehicle. It doesn't matter whether the vehicle you choose to travel around Australia is a two-wheel drive or a four-wheel drive. These days, most places can be reached with both. But it is important that your vehicle is in good mechanical condition. The tyres must be good, and that includes the spare. A well-made crash bar on the front is essential to protect the vehicle from wandering livestock. But make sure it's not too heavy. This one is made from exhaust piping welded with flat steel for strength as well as lightness. If it's too strong, even a small kangaroo at speed can twist the chassis and even bend the firewall. The idea is that it must give with impact. Late evening is a particularly dangerous time to encounter livestock on the road, especially unfenced roads of the outback. Sheep are about the most unpredictable animals, and they turn up even on highways. The bottom cross member of the crash bar is a hollow box, which we use as a sealed compartment for carrying enough engine oil for a complete oil change. A winch is a good idea for four-wheel drive vehicles, especially if you're travelling remote areas on your own. It's a good idea to have at least 80 metres of steel cable. There is usually something to winch on. It's amazing how solid small trees are. When winching out of sand and other loose surfaces, let the vehicle roll out. Don't drive the wheels. We have jerry can holders on the front too, which can be used for carrying water drums or for carrying petrol drums. 
and that's where the map consultations are very important, so you know what you do need. Incidentally, never carry fuel in the plastic ones. They're only any good for water. The metal army type is the only thing that's worth carrying fuel in. Incidentally, these water drums are handy because you don't have to mix, say, good water from rainwater with questionable creek water at any time. <whistles> Gypsy, here's a drink. And also, these, when they're stored in the sunlight all the time, tend to crack up in the heat. So after about 12 months, they should be discarded. Otherwise, you might find yourself halfway up the bird's foot track and you've got no water. A water bag is a good idea too, but make sure it's the type with the leather backing to protect the bag and with the wooden tie-off handle, not the wire type. The wire ones are designed for hanging under a veranda, not on a vehicle. Remember though that water bags use some of the water for cooling, so if you're in desert regions and short of water, don't use it. Many people dislike the taste of water bag water, but it seems to disappear in time. If you find the taste impossible to get used to, mix some cordial with it. By the way, carry the syrup in glass bottles, not plastic. Plastics shatter with the vibrations of corrugated roads. Now what sort of spare parts you need to take is a much more difficult question. But there are some items which are absolutely essential. And they are distributor points, radiator hoses, and that means a complete set of hoses. Also, a complete set of spark plugs. If you have ignition trouble in the bush, you don't know which one it is, you replace the whole lot. And most important of all, a fan belt. Now, in addition to this, you must have a workshop manual. It's amazing what you can do with a simple set of basic tools when you use the workshop manual and just follow the instructions. A special item worth having is a spark plug pump. Now with this simple device you remove a plug from the car engine and put that in its place and run the hose off to the tyre and you can inflate your tyres from dead flat to fully inflated in a few minutes. You'll notice that we keep these uh, spare parts in a handy carrying basket right under the bonnet where you'll need them. This disastrous rollover could have been avoided it was rough country all right, but we also had an overloaded roof rack. Roof racks don't have to lead to trouble though, provided they are packed intelligently with only lightweight equipment. Most vehicles were never designed to have a roof rack in the first place, but if you decide to use one, make sure that it's very light in construction, but still sturdy. For a round Australia trip, we recommend anchoring it to the side with bolts rather than welds, because welds tend to crack up, and besides, they ruin the appearance of the vehicle. Now, anything can be carried on the roof rack, even such delicate items as the baby's playpen, provided it's wrapped properly. Now, that means putting it in the canvas like this, bringing the back flap of the canvas forward first, and then bring the sides in. With the sides in, you can then bring the front of it back. Having done that, you then strap it in position. You can use either these rubber elastic stretch straps, or, much better still, these boat straps designed to hold boats onto trailers and when they're clamped down tightly, they don't move. The roof rack, when used properly, can increase storage areas enormously. It's a good place to carry a lightweight canoe or dinghy to explore swamps and rivers. This way your trip opens up new country. Probably the most memorable glimpses of wildlife come from the canoe in quiet estuaries. Inside, we fitted a fire extinguisher. Absolutely essential for outback journeys, but have it tested frequently and make sure it works and mount it in a handy position. We've also fitted a long-range fuel tank. This more than doubles our capacity, and that's very handy too in the outback. And of course, it's always nice to have more than you really need. We also have a trouble lamp with a long lead on it. This can be useful as a camp light as well, and especially at night when you go to bed, you can turn it off in the tent. Incidentally, gas lights aren't such a good idea in tents because they, well, they can be a fire hazard, and also they generate a lot of heat. In the back of the Jeep, we've fitted drawers where all the food is stored. The suitcases and personal items go on top. 
It beats digging for every little thing. Another good item is a well-equipped picnic set. It will contain all your knives and bits and pieces. And if a hot flask of tea or coffee has been prepared at breakfast, roadside stops can be kept to a minimum. You can get on with seeing the country. And that brings us to cooking equipment. Portable gas stoves are by far the most convenient. Lighting open fires is getting to be too difficult. Fire regulations restrict it. And these days, portable gas can be acquired almost everywhere. When it comes to packing your uh, gas stove, pack it very carefully. Which brings us to the packing of the food. Lorraine, that's more in your department. Before we look at packing, consider saving weight in the food department. Dehydrated food is good, but only in areas where you can get lots of water. If you find you have to carry water, then you may as well take canned foods. When you pack your food, make sure it's tightly packed in, with no room for movement. Then you can tackle the toughest tracks without breaking anything, including the eggs. In a loosely packed compartment, everything, even cans, will break. When the food starts going down, fill up the spare room with other items, like towels or sleeping bags. Going to touch now on sleeping gear. Even though it doesn't have much to do with the vehicle itself, it's important because it helps keep the weight down. I don't think you can go past the airbed and the sleeping bag. Of course, you do have to inflate the airbed each evening, but don't try blowing it up with your mouth. It's far better to save your lungs for breathing in the clean country air you've travelled so far to enjoy. A foot pump takes less energy and less time. A tip with a sleeping bag is always use an inner bag. Make it from a flannelette sheeting for winter and cotton for summer. It provides the comfort of sheets and can be easily washed, leaving the sleeping bag clean. You simply slip into it like a giant sock. The type of tent you choose is largely a matter of how much comfort you're prepared to sacrifice. The small two-man type is ideal for a quick pack up in the morning, but the larger type with standing room is ideal for an extended trip. As you can see, most of what we've said is common sense, and we've only touched on the most essential items here. There are many more preparations which are a question of personal choice, such as what sort of clothing to take and so on. But again, use common sense and above all, don't overload your vehicle and you'll have a trouble-free journey. We have a letter here from Mrs A. Wheatley of Alderley in Queensland and she writes, during a recent holiday to Alice Springs, a friend of mine visited an outdoor sculpture display at a place called Pitchy Ritchie. It sounded like a very interesting idea, and I wondered if you would be interested in filming Pitchy Ritchie. Well, to tell us something about Pitchy Ritchie, we spoke to Mrs Corbett, whose husband set up the place. How long is it since the sculptures were first set into the sanctuary? Oh, it's, it's a matter of nearly 20 years now since Leo and Bill Ricketts, who's the sculptor, the man from Victoria, came up from um, Victoria and Leo drove the truck and Ricketts came up because he wanted to get out amongst the Aborigines too. So the sculptors have been up here nearly 20 years. Nearly 20 years? Yes. And what was the reason that your husband set up the sanctuary? Well, after Ricketts went back, of course, he left the sculptures here and Leo thought that it would be very nice to have them in this beautiful setting, which really is a delight. And he was fascinated by the rocks out in the mountains, the McDonald's roundabout. And so his idea was to set them up in this very appropriate area where the Aborigines live, but he wanted to use the rocks that he found as he went about amongst the hills. And was it set up, someone said it was set up for the local people to sort of come in as a peaceful resting place, but I notice now that sort of you get more tourists than locals, wouldn't you? Yes, I think we do get more tourists than locals, but we still get our locals who are very, very keen on Pichuichi. Um Leo just wanted to share what he had with the folk who came to the centre. He was just happy to live here and uh, he hoped that by setting up a place like this other people could get some enjoyment out of what he was able to do. Leo Corbett spent years establishing this quiet parkland setting on the banks of the Todd River near Heavy Tree Gap at Alice Springs. He named it Pitchy Ritchie, which in Aboriginal language means a break in the range. 
Bill Ricketts kiln-fired clay sculptures fit beautifully into the natural rocks in the McDonnell Ranges, each one set in place by Leo to take full advantage of the light and shade of Pitchy Ritchie. These are the emu spirit children. All Aborigines believe they are descendants of the Dreamtime people who made all the physical features of the landscape which exist today. Their idea of creation was that the earth was a flat featureless mass inhabited by colossal animals and birds with human heads. These were the people of the dream time. They moved around the country making rivers, mountains and all physical features as they travelled. In this way every area was represented by an animal. The people today believe they are descendants of the dream time beings who made the area in which they were born. So we have emu men, lizard men and so on. The famous Aboriginal artist Albert Namajira was a flying ant man. In their idea of birth, as a woman passes through an area, the spirit children float into her body, and when the child is born, it becomes a descendant of the animal of that area. This sculpture represents a tree sheltering the animals from a bushfire. The Alurija natives who live near the Gibson Desert hold some corroborees on moonlight nights. The old men of the tribe warn the children to keep away and stay in their whirlies when the moon is full. If they don't, they will be picked up and taken away. This beautiful work shows a little girl who disobeyed the elders and has been carried away through the clouds by the moon man. As well as the sculptures, Leo Corbett set up a museum section as a personal tribute to the pioneers of the outback. In the museum section of Pitchy Ritchie, we have some household items which would have been familiar during the day of the pioneers. This old ringer, which was the forerunner of the washing machine. And here's the heating apparatus, the old copper, and a very early invention of the washing machine, which was hand operated. This is the equivalent of a refrigerator. It was the old Coolgardie safe. The water was placed in the top, it would run down onto wet strips of blanket, and the food was placed in the centre there to keep it cool. And for the lighting plant, well, the candle was a thing. This candle mould was uh, used by putting tallow inside and a wick. When it set, you tipped the candles out and you had enough light for a week. These and hundreds more items have made Pitchy Ritchie a fascinating place to spend a few peaceful hours in an idyllic setting at the foot of the McDonnell Ranges, a place Elsa Corbett is proud of. Leo literally gave his life for the place. He loved people and he loved sharing what he had. And over the years he developed the place and we now feel it's of such worth that we'd like to keep it going uh, because he died just about four years ago literally digging sand or making a new area for picnic pe where people could picnic and so knowing the value that he put to this place we're just endeavouring to keep it going. Well thank you Elsa and it's a fitting memorial for a man who spent most of his life here and thank you Mrs Wheatley for writing in and asking the Leyland brothers. We have a letter from Mr J Bartley of Dudley, New South Wales. He writes and says, I've heard that there is an active volcano in New South Wales somewhere, in the Hunter Valley. If there really is such a volcano, would you show it to us please? Well Mr Bartley, we didn't find your volcano, but this is probably what you heard about. Soon after the first white settlers arrived in the Upper Hunter, a convict farmhand discovered this burning mountain. He thought it was a volcano. It made the headlines in the Sydney newspapers in 1828 when they announced that a volcano had been discovered in the Hunter Valley. It caused quite a sensation. Several expeditions set out to discover if it was true. They even went back to Sydney with glowing reports about the authenticity of the find. It wasn't until several years later that the real truth about the mountain came out. Mount Wingen, the burning mountain, is actually a seam of coal burning 1,000 feet underground and has been doing so for several thousand years. It is now estimated to be burning away at the rate of about one metre per year. Nestled near the base of the burning mountain is a small township of Wingen, which takes its name from the mountain. It lies about 160 kilometres up the Hunter Valley on the New England Highway. Just past the township, a track turns off the highway and winds past sheep paddocks to a parking area where a walking trail takes over.
sightseers must climb 300 metres up from the valley to reach the summit of Mount Wingen. It's about a mile's walk from the vehicle to get to the top of the mountain here to have a look at the burning mountain. And it's a long way on a day like today, in the middle of summer. It certainly takes it out of you. you know, we're nearly there now, so we'll carry on. Close to the top of the mountain, large cracks in the ground are visible where the weight of the rock has caused a subsidence as a thick seam of coal 400 metres below has burnt out. Heat can be felt rising out of these fissures as we approach the burning area close to the top of the mountain. A tremendous amount of heat rises from the burning area where the coal seam is now estimated to be burning about 160 metres below the surface. The burning section covers about an acre and is extremely hot to walk on. Smoke and sulphurous fumes emit from the dozens of vents in the ground. These sulphur-covered holes are probably what caused the early explorers of the mountain to assume that it was a volcano. The Aborigines named the mountain Wingen, which means fire. Their explanation of the origin of the burning mountain was that one day a tribesman was lighting a fire on the mountainside when he was carried off deep into the earth by the evil one. Unable to escape, he used his fire stick to set the mountain alight so that the smoke might warn others to keep away. But today it is the fire that attracts people to see this unique natural wonder, the only one of its kind in Australia and the largest in the world. The ground is so hot it can melt the rubber soles on our shoes and one could easily boil a billy on the heat emitting from the vents. At the turn of the century, the sulphur around the burnt area was collected by a patent medicine firm to be used in a cure-all medicine. Wingenia Proprietary collected the sulphur-coated rocks and carted them by horseback down the mountain. Preparations made from this material were nothing short of a miracle medicine, if one believed the advertisements in the Sydney Gazette of 1906. It read, These wonderful Wingenia remedies are prepared from an extraordinary natural product given to man by the great alchemist, the grand architect of the universe, and found only in the burning mountain at Wingen, 200 miles north of Sydney. The photos show the chemist, two men and a boy of the Wingenia proprietary, gathering the peculiar substance that contains the condensed sulphurous fumes that give the immense value in complaints and any trouble with the mucous membranes. The medicine makers weren't the only people interested in Mount Wingen. We spoke to Mr and Mrs Gray of the Scone Historical Society. I remember, oh, nearly 60 years ago now when I was young, my father used to tell us that the smoke we could see up to the north up here was the smoke from the burning mountain and uh, that it was Mount Wingen. And he often used to say that on a still day you could tell what the weather was going to be like from the smoke from the mountain. One of the uh, interesting things about the Burning Mountain is that it was discovered because a stockman on one of the properties, Crestfield, saw the smoke and noticed over the weeks, as the weeks went past, that uh, it didn't move and he thought that was an unusual bush fire to stay in the one spot all that time. So he went to investigate. Became very excited when he saw it because he thought he'd found a volcano. Even though it wasn't a volcano, the mountain attracted a lot of visitors. It would have been quite an expedition in 1905 for these ladies in their finery to see Mount Wingen. Today, it still attracts visitors, and it probably will until it eventually burns itself out. Experts predict that when the fire reaches a fault in the coal seam, the mountain may cease to burn. But this could still be a few thousand years away. If there's anything you'd like to know about, don't forget to ask the Lowland Brothers. Write to Post Office Box 900, Newcastle, New South Wales, 2300. Don't forget, Newcastle, Post Office Box 900. <laughs> countryside, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, travel all over the countryside, ask the Leyland brothers. 
Whatever it is that you want to see, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, no matter whatever that happens to be, ask the Leyland brothers.